We're going live, babe. Hey, good morning and welcome. Hope you have uh, your regular coffee and not the decaf so that uh, you can catch a lot of what I'm going to do. Thank you, David, for your help with the Lakes Region Watercolor Society and happy to share with you all I know in an hour and a half. <laughs> so I kind of laugh at that, but uh, the beauty of this actually is, uh, has a lot of positives in that I can show you some great close-ups I'll be able to uh, share with you a lot more paintings and visuals and so forth. I can give you lots of information that you can watch over again. So we'll keep the link live so you can watch the video again and uh, we'll take advantage of that. So stay safe, stay home, and let me share with you uh, some fun things about watercolor. And actually I was thinking and preparing for this the, uh, yesterday, thinking through uh, what was it, I'll grab your mic, Linda, too, with you. Uh, what was it I was going to have as a kind of a topic? And, you know, you've had great art instruction. You've seen a lot of great demos. I wanted to share with you a little extra time on how I prepared before I started painting. Uh, David, you probably admit as well, sometimes your students and mine, they grab a great photograph, they sit down, sketch it quickly, and start painting and maybe didn't plan a few things. And so I'm gonna go through that I have spent a good amount of time planning, sometimes even practicing, before I dive into the painting. And uh, maybe that just might encourage you to do the same. Do some planning once in a while. Uh, think through the values, the color, the focal point, and items like that. And uh, see if that planning can ensure the, the main element that we try to always accomplish when doing a painting is to have that, that confidence. Oh, I feel good, I'm gonna go ahead and do it this way. By not having thought through, is it light enough, dark enough, where was I gonna use what color and so forth, you then paint with a little trepidation and that then causes the painting to look kind of stiff and careful and staged and so forth. So the bigger the plan, the better the turnout, I can assure you that. So we're gonna go through some of the uh, planning stages. We're gonna draw a name later on and uh, win a spot in my class. Thought I should share with you some of the materials you might not be you know, exceptionally familiar with me and so forth and materials that I use. So I kinda wanna stage that. Um, the virus has uh, caused me to use some sheets of paper I had laying around for a while and uh, checked out the Fabriano Extra White. And wow, I really love seeing that white surface. And there's a noticeable difference between, you know, good papers. I'm not against arches. I don't use it. It doesn't work well with my spray bottles. I've used a, a paper called Gemini, distributed by Strathmore. It's going to be discontinued soon is what I am told. So I started doing some searching. And that extra white just made, you know, made some of my colors pop a little bit more when I had you know, some white area in the painting. It just had that little extra highlight or glow. And I do leave a good amount of white most times in my painting. So it works well with my spray bottles. By that I mean when I'm and painting like shadows, uh, the paint doesn't set in as fast or dissolve in as deep because I do a lot of lifting off of dry color. And I want a little extra time before the color starts absorbing in especially with some of those shadows and techniques I might be using. So I have switched to the Fabriano Uno. Uh, I used to use uh, Holbein and I have found the uh, Sennelier colors, which is what's important to me, just have a little extra pop of color. Uh, they don't clog my spray bottle, they're a little creamier. 
I think it's the honey that they add to it that gives the color a little enhancement. And surprising, I have always been fearful of colors like phthalo, staining colors. I didn't want it to always be there. Maybe I want to change my mind and lift off some color later on. So I've made a change to the uh, Sennelier colors. Uh, and I'll share with you um, some of the issues that uh, I like particularly a little bit better. In fact, a big, a big thing better is that uh, I was surprised that the, uh, uh, the, the 20 ml was practically the same price as the uh, so larger, 40% larger, same price of the tube. So nothing wrong with that during these times. So you're welcome to ask questions. I've got Linda uh, reading your text while I'm going to paint away. We'll shift between a couple of cameras. We'll try and keep it um, really interesting for you and something different. So I'm going to take you overhead the overhead camera uh, and share with you a few aspects of my plan. And I'm going to have a few questions along the way. What would you do? Uh, what would you choose? Uh, I'll wait a second and see if, uh, uh, and just think about an answer because I'm going to surprise you with uh, uh, a few things as well. So uh, I did some planning. Um, let me take you in close you know, for this particular scene here. And it's a combination. Seldom do I have, you know, one photograph, you know, that I'm working from. Here's one of my books, you know, for example, this Monet garden scene. I mean, I had several different angles, different flowers uh, that I even added that weren't even there. So a good number of times I am building a painting from two, three, four. Sometimes if I had a sky in this one, I would have a fourth photograph, you know, to build a painting. So I'm building paintings as opposed to finding one picture and starting painting. So I had a photograph of this, you know, country church. Uh, let me move even closer there. Uh, a farmer's field fence line, another photograph of a building. I'd actually taken that, you know, from a different uh, painting that I had done and decided I'd like that particular grouping. I'll use it again. C skies and clouds, they come from a whole series of photographs. So a good number of times I'm photographing parts. So prior to this painting, I gave, as you can see, a little thought for uh, uh, value change. Uh, and I make use of uh, a sketch and wash pencil. So General Pencil has this sketch and wash pencil. And the beauty of this particular pencil uh, is that it dissolves. This is a, uh, called a water brush, so there's water in the barrel. And I can quickly, you know, dissolve this and experiment with what I might do for the sky. Uh, you know, if I want to come back and add some shading. And so that is how I do my shading. Some of just using the cross hatch of a pencil doesn't fill in, I feel, well enough. By that I mean you can't see a solid tone. So I've given thought to some of the lights, uh, medium and dark areas, you know, of a painting as a little plan in advance. Uh, I've given thought to some colors, you know, that I might use. I want to have a warm color uh, feel for this particular painting. I want to capture, you know, a little bit of an early autumn and have a warm color. So I was experimenting with what darks that I might use, you know, that are warm color what light colors I might use that are warm color. So prior to painting, I'm even thinking through what tone, what value, and I'm even giving thought to the proportion of the painting. So when I do a sketch, I have a lot of room around the outside and deciding do I want to have, you know, there be a, uh, a high horizon line or a low horizon line. And so I, you know, crop it around and decide maybe I want to have a large area in the bottom or maybe a smaller area and have each of these proportions be a different size. And so there, the middle is a little larger, light's a little smaller, dark is a little smaller yet. And maybe I'll have a high horizon line. So I don't create, you know, a, a rectangle to begin with. I kind of decide on it later on. And so I'm thinking about dividing this in that particular proportion, have a big sky. And I'm doing that because I have something I want to do at the end of the painting, a little trick I want to share with you uh, along the way. So there's that thinking in advance before I start a painting. You know, I spent an hour going through different items, erasing and adding and so forth. And so there's a little plan before I start. Now, before I paint, I want to share with you a few lessons and a few charts uh, that I have that kind of share with you where I'm going and what's my thinking. So these are visuals that I've created over the 50 years of teaching. 
Nothing wrong with being photographic or picture perfect, but it isn't really where I want to go any longer. I do it once in a while, uh, the laborious process of having every blade of grass, you know, and every little detail of the, of the wagon and so forth. And instead, so I make a dis conscious decision, do I want this to be more realistic or do I want it to have a little what I call artistic? Not that realism isn't art, I'm not saying that at all, but I wanna have a little more flair, a little more creativity uh, in the creation. So let's use this chart to share with you, you know, my thinking there in that I wanna have color take place of detail. I wanna have it to be a little brighter. I want it to have a little more variety. The looser I paint, the less the viewer looks and expects detail. So a good number of times, if you paint too tight, the viewer is going to start naming what it is, where it is, and who owns it. And so I wanna keep that uh, thought out of the viewer's mind and let them just say, hey, this is a, a form of creativity, having a lot of fun with darks and lights, and the whisk wheel is light, and that part of the wheel is dark, and that variation here, part of the wagon is dark in front of light but this part of the wagon is light in front of dark. So those are patterns that I purposely create, colors that I enhance that aren't real, so the viewer is enjoying the creativity of my color and contrast instead of expecting it to look like a photograph. And so there is what I think of while I'm painting. I'm not thinking of board or rock or cloud, I'm thinking of the variety of color, the strong contrast, positive and negative, and having a little underlying theme along the way. And yes, I go through this kind of a checklist, you know, prior to starting the painting. I'm very concerned about and watching out for as I do a, a sketch. These are very static shapes that I, I tend to look out for and avoid. Circle, square, rectangle, triangle, and straight lines. So there's an up and down and in and out, you know, to the sketch. And so I've made the you know, that tree just kind of go up so there wasn't a straight line of the horizon line. Whatever grouping or shadow I have in front, again, is not too straight of a line, avoiding that. So that's what these little bumps and hiccups, you know, even the church along the way is meant to give a little variety of shape. So composition is so important. Spend some time with it. It may sound a little more difficult to work with it that way, but here's where if you have a good composition, you don't need technique to save the painting. Yes, your style can be loose and it can be just as good a painting as someone else's style that's very tight. As I did, I already thought through the value change. I was planning out what variety of color. Uh, being very artistic, that's the variety of color in an area and playing with positive and negative. I've given thought to the impact area. And so here comes question number one. There you have that particular scene. Where do you think the focal point should be? I'll give you a second to decide and I'll tell you that majority of you thought the church down there at the end. And that is exactly what I am not going to do. So the point being, uh, by having that be the focal point, your job is to provide creativity. Surprise them once in a while that not the obvious is the focal point. So that I set you up a little bit by having that church and even the farmer's field and the fence line, you know, seemed like it was going towards that area. That does not mean you have to choose the most obvious element in a focal point. So that's a part of the creativity. So I avoid, you know, a lighthouse as being a focal point, landmarks as being a focal point, the obvious elements. If there's only one item, one figure walking down the road, I might include it in the painting, yes, but I don't make it the focal point. So as it surprises the viewer, and I don't want this to turn out like a courier and Ives, you know, collector plate when that church at the country church is the focal point and everyone's gathering to it. So there's where already you can start having some creativity and there's a uniqueness to it when someone says, oh, look at the church here. I didn't notice it at first. That little surprise is engaging the viewer in your painting. So there's a trick along the way um, to have the focal point not be the obvious. So I set you up with thinking that the church should be the obvious, and I bet the majority of you said, let's do that for the focal point. So here's a thought about the shapes I talked about that I watch out for. Uh, and I make little adjustments, having a three-quarter angle or joining these together, you know, a chimney or a dormer sometimes, or block the corner if it's a very stiff-looking corner with a tree or a bush or a shrub. So all of this 
takes place through some planning. Now, I don't do this amount of planning for every one painting, but either do little small, what are called thumbnails, where I might decide to have you know, it be a horizontal, or should I do it a vertical? Should I leave the bench out? Should I put the bench in the front? You know, so I'm doing some arrangements. If I don't have a thought for what to do in values, then I do a value study. And there's a couple of different ways, I'll share with you another chart in a moment, that there's values that could be a front and back way of using them, or just alternating them along, along the way. If I have a very complex scene, I do a miniature color study without doing any pencil sketch. So this art created from that photograph, now here's the beauty of watching this again, is you can put a stop to your program when you watch it later, and you can view that photograph, and then view this little quick sketch I did without doing any pencil sketching. So I was helping myself have this as a visual to make a painting from instead of having the photograph be my guide, because looking at a photograph is only going to make you paint it much tighter. So a good number of times if I say, hold, I'm gonna, guess, I'm gonna do too much detail if I uh, don't have something else to look at. And so sometimes a quick study, having me have that, helps me be, paint more loosely by having a small little sketch before I start. Here's what I was saying I was gonna prepare for you. There's a couple of ways of dealing with, and I'm, my thought, the secret of success in a painting are the lights and darks. Unless you're dealing with a, small, a strong mood, you know, of mist, haze, fog, or something like that, well then you could deal with a close range of values. I'll share with you a painting. You know, here, you know, as a scene that I'm trying to have the atmosphere be what's so important about it. So I'm not dealing with strong lights and darks. I'm just having a good, somewhat mid-tone dominant, just a little pop of dark for the focal point. But if you're not doing a special atmosphere, a good number of times I recommend you have a good use of lights and darks. Makes the painting a little bit more exciting, more dynamic, kind of commands the viewer to come in. And here's two options. You can deal with alternating by them next to each other, dark and then a light and then a dark and then a light and so forth. Or you could separate the front from the back. The front could be dark and the back could be light or the front could be light and the back could be dark. And that's somewhat what I'm gonna deal with in today's painting. Now then have a statement. What is it you wanna say in the particular painting? Uh, I could say I wanna have a, a feeling of shadows, then I would you know, paint the shadows first. If I want to have a feeling of lights and darks, I'll deal with the lights and darks first. If I want to have a strong atmosphere of the color of the sunset, I might start with that particular part first. And so the point is, make a decision. What is it you want to say when you're creating the painting? What do you want the viewer to feel when they look at the painting? Is it just a series of objects? And that was back there at the bottom of my checklist after focal point and deciding on the unity, which today is warm. What's the theme? Why are you painting this? And so have a, have a reason for a painting, have a theme for a painting, and let that be an underlying message that you wanna to say to yourself, those rich autumn colors and a glow of the sunset. And that's my plan for the day. Whether it be a still life, a figure, a portrait, uh, florals, I want a warm glow in that painting uh, and the highlight of autumn colors. A good number of times, I will start with the focal point. And so that's an area that you decide. And so let's come back to our sketch again and make a decision. I promise I'm gonna paint, but I wanna make you a better painter first. And I think I can do more for you by making you a better painter by going through some of these visuals, uh, these charts that I have in one of my books. So I make a decision where is the focal point. And yes, I kind of fooled you there a little bit by thinking it was gonna be in that particular area. And no, I'm gonna have it be in this zone here. And so there is a whole, I could spend another 20 minutes talking about proportion and balance and rhythm, but no reason for it to be in the sky. There's not much going on. I avoided the, the obvious uh, uh, having it right in the center. So I'm not gonna have the focal point right in the middle of the painting. Uh, not gonna be in the upper left or right. There's nothing there but a little bit of sky. In my focal point, I'd like to have a few extra things, such as I've got a couple of buildings, trees, forest, hill in the background, fence post, and grassy ground, so I've got several different items instead of the single church as being the focal point. And so I've made that decision, and what I've done for this particular painting today, I've actually started with that uh, focal point. 
And that then becomes a guide. So having the focal point painted first allows me then as I'm painting these trees to not have them be quite as exciting. As I'm dealing with the sunlight and shadows on the mountain, is it taking away from the focal point? But I still think in this area, there's a lot more excitement and variety that you can have this be interesting, but not more interesting than what's happening at the focal point. And oh, by the way, I did not make the man and his dog as the focal point. Isn't that special? Let's let you see that. There's the man walking his dog, and I didn't choose because there was only one of them, and it would have been too obvious of an item for that to be the focal point. So there's an example of starting with the focal point. It's what you do in that focal point that makes it more interesting. I have my best color, contrast, edges, and detail. I have some specialty colors that I make use of uh, when painting. I have a, uh, an opera rose. I have a thalo blue. Um, now these colors are going to have long names like blue and dancerine is what I use for darks. Check out my website, TomLynch.com, and you'll get a list of what colors I use in my palette. My thinking is to have a light, medium, and dark value of the brightest color that's made. So I don't need burnt umber, raw sienna. Uh, Payne's gray, those are dull colors. I like to make use of color instead of detail. Uh, I have a very high key yellow. It used to be a color called uh, permanent yellow lemon. It's similar to Windsor yellow. Uh, in Sennelier, the, the yellow color is called lemon yellow. I only guard you with that because the word lemon yellow, and again, this is a very uh, a creamy yellow that just uh, oozes out. So when I squeeze out you know, paint uh, in my palette, uh, you'll be able to see that it just melts and actually wants to run right away. That's how creamy, you know, that particular uh, aspect of the color is. So I'm not saying these are bad colors, but they just stay in that extruded form. So you have to do a lot more crunching, and I don't want them to clog up, you know, paint that I use in spray bottles. So look at the difference uh, right away and the creaminess. So uh, my point was that uh, uh, the yellow, the word lemon yellow in some brands is a rather pale yellow. Uh, in Sennelier, it's their brightest yellow that they make. Light, medium, and dark greens, light, medium, and dark reds, light, medium, and dark blues, an earth color burnt sienna, yellow ochre, and then I can cross mix colors to get them earthy as well. I believe in starting loose except for the focal point. I can always tighten up a loose painting. I believe in leaving uh, a lot of white uh, at the beginning of a painting. Uh, I can always cover up more white later on, and that sometimes I can do something special uh, with the white uh, color that I leave untouched at the beginning. So the thought of starting loose and leaving a lot of white is a plan that I generally use, not for every painting, uh, but is a good plan for you to have as a guide. You can always start this way, tighten it up a little bit, possibly a little bit more. Oh, one of these days I'll get rid of those green things. Uh, from passing my charts around that I've had these, and I have them in a book as well. In that, in that uh, idea of uh, starting loose, uh, I almost think abstract as I'm brushing down uh, some of the color you know, upon that particular area and not worried about being too careful and too exact. So that was a handful, but I just wanted to impart some information and not just do a painting and wow, Tom, yep, you've been painting for a long time, turned out great. I have no idea what to do or how I could follow from it. So I wanted to go you know, through some of these visuals so that I could impart to you some thoughts, some ideas, a little bit of direction. And there is no perfect way. So if you have a teacher that says, always do this, for example, my teacher said always do the sky first. And the majority of times, now, <laughs> <laughs> to the sky last, and I'll share with you why in a, in a moment or two. But that idea of giving you some options to choose, maybe the focal point first, maybe leaving more white, maybe starting loose might be fun, a different way. So if you're not doing something different, then the change is not going to be different as well. So that's the whole idea of sharing with you, doing something different along the way. So if you have some questions, you can type them down. Uh, so the brushes I make use of are sable brushes. So if there's anything that you buy that's of the best quality, get yourself, you don't need a lot, but get yourself a good quality brush. I'm going to use a three quarter inch and there's a uniqueness to the brush. It has a thicker section called a belly. I'll look at you overhead in a moment, share with you that. A little extra length out. Uh, I looked for one that had a longer handle so that I can start the painting loose by holding the back of the brush. 
I can tighten up and tighten up and tighten up by getting closer and then sitting down. And the painting will get real tight if you hold the brush here and you're sitting down. So the start of the painting is from the shoulder, letting it move and flow, just like uh, Shapiro taught us. Right, David? He knows what I'm talking about. So I have, uh, in addition to that, I don't use a lot of round brushes, uh, just my probably habit back in the illustration days uh, of using flat brush. But the round brush that I use is called the designer round. It has a more extended, a slow, gradual taper to the point. So instead of a, a point like this, it's a point that has a slow taper called a designer round. Uh, and I make use of that for my round brushes. And then a liner brush. So a super long, longer than the, uh, uh, the three quarter inch flat, uh, kind of wispy and use it for not only for lines and rigging, but actually for painting as well. So don't need a lot of them. I have a, I, I have a, I got a bunch. I got about uh, eight of these things full of brushes. So uh, I'm with you. When in doubt, get a new brush and see if that will change things a little bit. All right, let's come back over to the painting. I've been chit chatting enough and I want to share with you uh, something that I have here is that uh, on my little practice, uh, I have redrawn the little focal point area. I'll let you see the palette in a minute, but I wanted to give you a close up uh, along the way. Um, and I think it's a good time for me to back up and share with you the palette because there's a few colors that I make use of for my focal point. So I have this uh, opera rose. I have uh, phthalo blue that doesn't stain, so I'm not worried about it. The word phthalo in this particular case. I make use of these, uh, my brightest yellow, this permanent yellow lemon. Again, similar to Windsor, but Windsor Newton has a white paint in there, as you can see, where I squeezed out that other brand and it stayed uh, in the extruded position. Uh, here's a phthalo green light. So I'm using some of these high key bright colors. I don't use ochres and burnt siennas too much, you know, in my focal point, not too many dark uh, blues such as the ultramarine, so cerulean and a brighter red. So kind of a specialty set of colors that I make use of. Uh, and now I'll bring you in and just give you a little bit because I've already started this uh, already to save you some time not having to watch paint dry. So in this focal point area, I wanted things to be really bright, not because of sunlight. And notice I did make a big issue of identifying, you know, the source of, of light. Not every painting has to have a strong source of light. It has to have good lights and darks. And so even as I start this painting, when the brush disappears, I'm over in my bucket clearing the brush out, cleaning the brush out, and coming back and refreshing the color, and then adding some touches of color. So I'll let you uh, see that sequence in a moment here. And so I'm a strong believer. So there's a sponge here. I'm going to pull this away. There's another one underneath. Uh, and I clean out the brush frequently, dry out the brush, come over to the palette, refresh the color, and then give a, a, a few touches of that color. And I'm gonna be careful with my focal point. So I wanna have it be a little tighter, a little more variety of color, a little more enhancement. So I might just have a little accent of color here. Clean out the brush, dry out the brush. A little spot of light there. Clean out the brush, dry out the brush. Coming over here, mixing a new color. Nice, rich, deep color for that strong, dark side. So as the brush disappears, that's what you're seeing is that cleaning it out, drying it out, grabbing some fresh color. And now here's the beauty of your online demo. Then if I was there live, hey, you spared me having to come early and get a hotel room, stay overnight for your 930 demo. So now I'm cleaning out the brush, drying out the brush, leaving a little white space and here a little touch of color for the side of that particular um, building. A little accent of color. I did a little blotting. I want to put a touch of a different color going on there. That purple's coming into the yellow, so I'll blot it. So a little bright spot there. Clean out the brush, dry out the brush. Keep the color fresh. And so look at those little color shifts. Here's where I like the uh, extra white uh, paper, similar to the Gemini I used to use. I can come back and put a little dollop of, of a color shift, and it will. this first color hasn't started drying and settling into the paper yet, so that a watermark or blossom would happen if I had done that on other papers. Come back and throw a little extra paint and let it float. So I want a super dark uh, for certain parts. There's that phthalo blue, a little stronger color of blue going on in that particular section. Might leave the roof white. 
and I experimented with some of my dark colors. And so I'll make it even darker. Here's where this color called blue indanthrene. It's a super dark. And I'm now enhancing the contrast even greater in and around my focal point. Now, I can turn this into a, a bush or a shrub or a tree or just add a clear, uh, so this brush is clean, clear water on it. I cleaned it out. I touched the sponge. And I can just smooth that little dollop of extra dark. So I wanted to punch up the darks even greater in my focal point area. So the focal point, yes, I take my time. I put a little extra effort. I sometimes use even a smaller brush. I've got an old favorite brush that you know it's been around for 25 years. So you buy a good quality brush, they'll last you a, a, a long time. It's even a little smaller size. I might come back, you know, to that focal point area. I could dry it a touch and come in with some little accent darks like I've just done there. Punch up the color a little bit more if needed. So yes, in that focal point section is one spot different than that one chart that I showed you where I said start loose. So the other parts of the paint, I'll bring that chart in here slow. So the other parts of the painting, I'm going to have a little more loose like this. But in the focal point, it's a little more edgy, a little crisper set of edges. There's a touch of that farmer's field. I'm going to have a little dollop of some strong green. There's my new color I've just added to my palette. It's a phthalo green dark. So again, I think I've stayed away from certain colors. Some of the brand, different brands, can cause that phthalo color to be a staining color. And so I haven't had issues of lifting off the phthalo green or the phthalo blue. So as you can start seeing, don't want to have that running, so I'll blot this one section there. I want to have it be sharper edges and playing with stronger contrast, smaller brush strokes, and I'm adding browns to my green. I'm adding a burnt sienna to my hooker's green to warm it up. Because remember I said I wanted to have a, a warm color dominance to this painting. I want to have a nice high contrast to this painting. And I want to have just a little pop of cool color up at the corner of the roof there. Maybe a little piece at the corner here. So I'm coming back with what I call the secret sauce hitting it in with a little extra of these darks and lights. Let's have a little secret sauce accent. So the same color, slightly darker, or the same color with a little bit of that dark that I use called blue in dancing. So just an underneath. And notice it's not too perfect, too mechanical, too exact. So playing with these little extra contrasts at the focal point stage of the painting. So here's actually a, a, a practice. So I'm doing this on my practice little paper where I have the sketch and practice some colors and decided where the focal point was because I've already painted this because here's where a couple of times during this process I have done some drying of it and so I'll work further on this one and let's share with you uh, some of the extras let me take you in nice and close and I can point out a few of the uh, items of the extra detail so I've left extra white I have a little white for the roof, a little white you know, on the corners and eaves. Look at between the roof and the wall. Uh, I have a little extra white there. White paper still showing on the ground. The white paper helped pop out the color of light. I'm not worried about this isn't red enough color to go along with the red barn. I see that as yellow. I know that's a little orange, but that's kind of a color shift, a little excitement. That's creativity in action, where I wanted those particular colors you know, to pop out a little contrast on the ground. So when I'm painting uh, a good number of times uh, for the focal point, it might be part of the ground that I want to have to enhance the color. And I can see now I'm even going to enhance this color with a little bit of uh, one of my, my lemon yellows. And so I'm taking, uh, let you back up, see the palette, taking some of that lemon yellow and I'll come back and just do a little dry brush. That's where I use the side of the brush. And so I can get a dry brush because of the thickness of my brush. So that flat, it's a thicker flat than just some that have a uh, no thickness or belly. It has a little extra length out. And same with the, uh, the designer round so that I can use just the side of the brush. And now I can enhance that glow that warm glow that I wanted to have in this area. I did enhancement with the yellow. I'm going to take and enhance it with the uh, orange as well. I'm not worried about if it's the photograph said that it was green, whatever it was was green. 
but just by having a little color shift. So let's take a close look. I'll work on the painting further and I'll let you see just the intricacy. So let the focal point be where you want to take your time, be more intricate, uh, have a smaller little brush mark, a little dry brush so there's white for the ground, there's white on the, on the wall, there's white on the corners, there's white on the roofs, uh, even in the background areas there's white so I can add more color to that later. So remember that chart where I said leaving a lot of white, there you can see an example of leaving a lot of white and to me that is relatively loose. I just have edges in there, I have sharper edges you know, between the fence and the roof and so forth. I had a little bit of a, a light value to the uh, uh, roof in the background and I take, uh, took and went, came across it with the blue just to shade portions of it. I wanted to push that particular background, just have little highlights of, of white and not a lot of white showing for that area. So I'll continue building the painting now for you uh, and share with you, you know, that process where you can see the palette to the side uh, and I have a, already have another one at that stage dry so you can see what's taking place and along the way we'll build this painting, get to the sky. Now here's where I have this bright yellow of a color and I want to have a nice light color to a tree here and so I have that one to look at. So having painted that first, that's telling me don't go quite as bright with that particular yellow, whether you use the side of the brush where I come back and, uh, and use a sponge, you know, to suggest the color. So I'll, I'll collect a bunch of sponges that all have different, you know, patterns in them. So that's a little wilder pattern. This is a little tighter, smaller pattern and use a sponge just like I would a brush, clean it out, mix it up, have a little darker color, clean out the sponge, dry out the sponge. I like working with the sponges that are a touch drier so that their pattern is noticeable. Otherwise, if they get too wet, you won't see some of the, uh, some of the bumps. And so I'll take you in and it's about, uh, I have an unwritten rule that I use when I make a painting. One basic color and two accents. And so there's the start of the, of the painting. I have a yellow, I have kind of an orange. I'm going to come back and actually introduce a touch of green, that variety of color. And so here's where I have my, I'll look at other paintings while I'm creating my painting so that I get more feeling of making it be painterly or colorful or art-like. So I'll use the side of the brush. I'm going to have some purples for this particular one. There's a cobalt and a magenta to creating a violet color at the same time. This tree here, I might incorporate a little more green. So I'm adding a, my phthalo green and putting a yellow ochre with it to warm up that particular green. And yes, I'm thinking about this layer in front is light and this layer in back. And I even do, as you've seen there, see some cross hatch shading uh, with my pencil. And so I do that just so that I make sure that I'll make it dark enough or it's telling me, it's reminding me if I don't see my sketch. And you may worry about that pencil line. That pencil line is a guide to tell me, you better paint it dark enough, otherwise you're gonna see those pencil marks. And so it makes me even paint it darker by having that type of crosshatch shading to the darker areas. So this is all about color, that chart, look at it again when you have a chance that says think like an artist and I'm thinking about color variety. The brush might disappear coming back and just adding little dollops here. I don't care if it has a watermark or blossom. I'm kind of building. I'm starting that loose. If there was a building in here, that's the same way I would have painted across. I would not have done the careful edging that I have in my focal point. So I have the focal point to tell me, look at all the crisp edges. Don't do those type of edges over in that particular area as well. I'll let this blend right into, and yes, I'm going to have that church back there. You're going to find it, but I'm not going to have it jump off the page. And I'm mixing a variety of colors. So before painting any one item, like those trees you just saw, look at the variety of colors I mixed in the palette first before I started applying them. So I'm mixing a variety of colors that I'm about to use for the church in the background. I'm not going to use that uh, opera rose color. I'm going to have cerulean and cobalt of a cobalt and a magenta and let those be the colors so they're not too exciting uh, not too dramatic of a color change. I'll have a little yellow ochre which will give a gray. So and a little 
red with that, gray it down even more. So the colors are nice. I'll take you in close, take advantage of this online stuff. So you can gain from that and be sure you can watch this all over again. We'll keep the link live for another week for you to see what's happening. So I'm having not as many edges. I'm kind of starting with a, uh, almost a feeling of shadow across, a variety of color to the, sh to the shadows. Come back with a little bit of that violet color. Even a touch of a gray green blending in. So those little color varieties, not as bright a color, keeping that look. I may have a little light value tree kind of to the next of it. And here I'll let things run into each other. So the color that I'm putting for a bush or a shrub or a tree back there, I'm letting run into the tree that I painted here that's still wet, letting running into the house that I've still painted that's kind of wet. Suggests some of the colors on the ground, some of that farmer's field plowed pattern. Even though those directional lines are going to lead you to that focal point, there's not going to be as much contrast. So compare, you know, the contrast here and here. You can see, even though there's that directional pattern, the energy of bright color, strong contrast, sharp edges, and white space is still going to keep the viewer's eye going, coming back eventually to this area. So I don't have to have every farmer's field plowed row point to the focal point. And I'm having a suggestion of. So let's go over onto the left hand side, throw a little variety of color, suggestion of buildings over there. Good. And all I have to do is compare back at the focal point. So painting the focal point first is like having me, your teacher, right next to you. And you have the brush loaded up and you're asking the teacher, is it OK if I use you know, this mixture on the brush or the sponge? And the answer is going to be as long as this color doesn't take away from the focal point. And I use more greens because I hardly had any greens over here. So I'm going to start out with more greens. I'll warm them up with the little burnt sienna or a little bit of yellow ochre. I'll clean out the sponge and I'll come back and add a fresh mixture of a little bit of that cobalt and magenta. For bushes, shrubs, or trees, I'll take and use a brush, a sponge. I'll have a burnt sienna ochre combination for the building with a hint of red. And so I've got those colors ready in the palette. Now coming in and applying them. That wasn't a clean color, so I'll blot it tissue hand hand all the time. Good number of times so I can blot away a color. Block it down. Now I have enough paint to finish the whole building. I had enough smarts to stop and say, wait a second, let's just have a little color shift. For the sake of art, I'm having these little color shifts. And what you'll gain from this is at the end of this big wash, you can take a look at it. You won't feel the need to add as much detail. There won't be as need for as much fixing by having these variety of colors there. That'll take the place of having to have detail in the painting. So yes, I've got a few suggestions of parts and pieces. Seems like a roof or a building, a wall. Here's where I like where the colors didn't set, so I can come back and add a green to that purple. I'll run this color for the tree right into some of the building. So there is not a perfect, so I'll give you a little close up here. So you can see how the colors are running into each other. So I can come back later and separate these parts if needed. But you get a feeling that there might be a roof there. I came back and enhanced, you know, that one little section, you know, with a touch of the uh, of the green. Let the green of this run into the roof. Let this wall run into some of those trees. And so I can. There's an example of not having it be as tight. And you can see that right next to the focal point, it's not as bright a color, not as strong a contrast, not quite as tight of a application as the focal point, but yet still interesting and still simple enough. And here's a perfect example of coming back later uh, and refining it with some more detail. I have a choice in the ground to have a gradual value change or a series of value changes. By that I mean uh, I might have a, I'm going to change that color to a little burnt sienna in that mixture that's green. So I might deal with a little patchwork because here I did the linear application for the farmer's field. And so here I'm going to deal with a, a series of sections or what I call patchwork quilt patterns for the ground. And let it just touch and dissolve in 
once again, this is not didn't dry so fast, I can come back and put the color of uh, what I have on the ground in there as well. And maybe a hint of the farmer's field. I'll look and see what colors I have here. I'm going to go for the orange color over on this side. And just as, as I said, a suggestion, a hint of it. A light little dollop, a little set of patchwork colors going on over here as well. There's a layer of that color. Now there's a layer of a green color. And my design, my plan, I still have close by, taking a look at it along the way. It's telling me that I'm going to have it be a, a, a dark value in the background. So I'm going to go back and follow what that plan has said and clear out what's happening in my palette. So here's where having this guide close by, having this visual, it's not about painting parts, it's just the suggestions. And I've used that dark hill in the background that's probably shadowed from that cloud so that I can create the depth. And if I have a good feeling of depth in the painting, I won't then sense the need to come back and do a lot of detail. So I'm letting depth be more interesting than the refinement of detail. And a way to help yourself not overwork a painting is going to be taking a look at what you have behind a mat frequently. And so that's an important step along the way to making art is to look at what you have you know, behind a mat. It kind of separates it, cleans it up, cleans up the view, takes away you know, seeing the, uh, the background. Even a smaller mat helps you see some of those parts. And so I can see there's not a lot of depth. There is here. There's not a lot of depth, so I'm confident that that dark is going to be an important stage that I have along the way. So ultramarine blue, my alizarin crimson, burnt sienna, makes a nice little rusty dark. I want them to be warm. My hooker's green is going to have a burnt sienna added to it, so it warms it up. I'll have a blue and danthrene, which is my dark but I don't like Payne's gray again or neutral tint or lamp black. So it's a dark that's colorful, mixes well. Here's my thalo green. Uh, it's a cool color green, so I'm going to add some burnt sienna to it as well. So I have a nice range of darks before I start painting. Uh, and then it's a matter of cleaning out the brush, dry out the brush, and remix. Don't just pick up color laying in the palette. So I can come back in with some of this contrast. And I'm going to leave a space. I'm going to leave a little white space. Let me show you that little white space. I, I don't need to dry this because uh, I'm going to leave a little white space along the way. Well, we'll have a white roof, obviously. So I'm cleaning out the brush, dry out the brush, coming back in. Careful application. So this painting, actually, I'm using the round more than I normally do. So it's good, good to change that even for me. So I'm having some extra dark in and around that particular church. So trust me, I'm looking over at the part of the painting you don't see to see that it doesn't take away from. I've got that rusty color. I'm slowly going to evolve from that rusty color uh, into the hooker's green. I've thought about these different sizes. These are different sizes of darks. Um, that I have in the painting, different proportions. I don't want this same width again. I don't want that same size dark to repeat it again as well. Here comes the largest size of the dark. And it's not quite as heavy. I'm adding a little more water. So the strength of the dark isn't as bold as what is over closer to the focal point. Along the way, even if there isn't in the photograph, I'm going to have a little change of pace. Here's where I'll start incorporating, making some of the art using, you know, my spray bottles. And so these are spray bottles that I had custom made that I have, they uh, spray out a dot. And so the pattern, let me grab a spare sheet of paper uh, and share with you that particular pattern. So spray bottles spray out a mist like this. I can lightly tap and I can get a pattern like that. Add to that a little spray of clear water and watch what her dots now turn into leaves. So I use this for many, many different things in the painting, but look at how those dots of paint turned into a leaf-like pattern. And so that's where I put some, just for the sake of difference, didn't want to use the round brush or the flat brush, just have a little spray bottle emit a little color. By having them not absorb in so fast, I can blot away some of the ones that I don't want. It's a great tool to have a color fix. If you didn't like what a color was, 
Uh, you could have taken a little spray bottle as a little enhancer. Could have thrown a little yellow at the top in that particular. So it's a color adjuster and it makes uh, art uh, great for these forests. So let me share with you. And so here's where spray bottle on top of dry color, you can come back later and give just that little essence. So that's the same, you know, light value, but you don't want a fine mist of, of spray. You want there to be some dots. Great spray to have when painting shadows, creates a bumpy edge, creates very interesting branches along the way. I almost wish I had a country road in this painting because I could sh uh, share with you where I would have put tape on either side. So a spray bottle of yellow ochre in the back, spray bottle of burnt sienna that had the dot pattern uh, in the middle and it's a cobalt and a magenta for the front. And so whether it be a, a country road, a sandy beach uh, of an, a grassy field, something different than the brush is why I make use of the, uh, of the spray bottles. They, f they fit right in. They create little bumpy branches. So the spray bottle was clear water on the paper while I painted branches and it turned that branch. Here I didn't do spray bottle of clear water. Look how the branch is rather stiff. But here I did put the spray bottle with clear water and as my brush came through, it made it very broken and irregular. It's great for doing springtime. Just those few little knots and twigs coming up for the spring. So look for, I have these where it's a yellow top and a purple neck that are able to spray out those kind of dots in the painting. So it's a great little color fixer along the way as well. Let's put some of that dark over on the other side. Tell them where they could get that. So oh, spray bottles at Art Academy, I get them from me. I, I'm the one that had them uh, made, but I, I don't have an e-commerce site at TomLynch.com. So TomLynch.com for lessons, ArtAcademyLive.com if you want to get some of those dot spray bottles. So continue this dark coming across. I do online classes, they're different each month. Uh, not a workshop format, so these are specialty classes with special techniques. For example, we did a three hour class on spray bottles and we did a three hour class last month on composition and we're gonna do one coming up on fall colors. You can get a hold of what those classes are, again, at my website or email me. At the end of this, you'll see a tab that says show more when you re-watch this video. Click on that show more and you'll see a drop down menu. It'll tell you where to get spray bottles, where the list of my classes are and details like that. So TomLynch.com for classes. TomLynch watercolors at Gmail if you need to ask a question about those classes. So I'm coming back and just enhancing. So see where that dark made a tremendous effect on having, and I kind of had it melt in over here, not quite as dark on this particular side. So instead of having you watch paint dry, I have done something good for you. I have repainted this uh, yesterday and it's already, already dry so I can move forward uh, and share with you a couple of uh, uh, neat effects that you might not think about. So again, I should have asked you in the beginning about paint and sky first. Well, I don't do it first because it then controls the rest of the painting. It covers up all of the white space. I'm not sure what colors seem to pop out in my focal point and I want that color in the sky to help the focal point. So I'll take you on a tour. I have another one of these that I've done that is, is dry uh, and I'll work on it further. Figured I'd do a demo without having uh, half the time taken up to watch paint dry. And so let me take you on a close tour. I'll start you with the focal point and you can see how it's careful. There's that white sharp edges, bright colors, white space on the ground, dry brush, you know, in that particular area. I put this large fence, that's a composition issue to stop your eye from getting out. And in the background, there's a little too much white, but uh, for the finish of the painting, there's not too much at the this stage. So I'm gonna share with you how I can uh, adjust that white later. And so I have some patchwork patterns. We talked about the patchwork value changes on the ground. And so I made use of those patchwork patterns. Let's come over to the church. And it's still there. It still has a nice variety of color, has a few rooftops hidden back there in the distance. I added a tree in front just to change the composition. I felt the long rectangle of the building or here, let me share with you the one we just did. Uh, there was another option for the church is to do a double roof. 
so I had a short roof and then a long roof next to it instead of just having that straight long one as it would seem. So either have that roof have a little break in the composition or do as I've done here and I have added a tree in front of that long roof line. And so I decided, well, okay, might have the long roof line, but let's not have it too boring of a line. Look at all the variety of color here, how this tree is different than that one. That dark contrast has some accents on the top. I like the other one with the spray bottle better than here. I should have used the spray bottle. Here I use the uh, brush. This tree is a little slightly different color than that one. They're still all of a warm sequence. I got a lot of white space left underneath there so I can do more with white space later on. This area still seems to glow and is bright. So I'm gonna finish working on the foreground and the sky. But I'm gonna share with you something that I do and I thought of doing it ahead of time but people don't believe it sometimes. So I am taking a, a brand of frisket called White Mask and I'm gonna save this particular tree. Let me bring in another painting. Uh, and share with you what it is I'm talking about. I'm gonna cover up existing dry color. So this particular painting, I could, there's no way I could have done the sky last and save the integrity of this color of the tree and the look at the little extra white highlights that there are around that tree. So I didn't use frisket on the ground, I used it on top of this dry color so I could have brush strokes going all the way across and not muck up what was there. If I did the sky first, I wouldn't have clean paper to put fresh color and white spots. So what I do a lot of times, yes, I use frisket, you know, to save white accents, but I use frisket uh, as well to try to find my old brush to use for the liquid frisket. I'm going to create an, oh, there it is. So I've taken an old natural hair brush and I'm, and this is dry, I painted it yesterday and I'm putting liquid frisket over dry color to save not only the color of the tree, but a little extra bonus white space. I don't need to put that frisket to save the dark tree line. I do want the sky to go over that distant tree line to soften the edge. So I'm just brushing, and you can't see this. It comes out white, but it dries transparent, and that's an important feature. So again, this is white mask but it dries transparent. I don't think my sky is gonna come this low. And so I do wanna save the little spot of this tree and a little extra white space, just in case I wanna save the church and the steeple and the roof and the wall. And so I'm putting it over dry color. You could have dried this color with a hair dryer and put it on today. You didn't have to wait a day to do this. So now, and also the point of this roof so I could paint this sky and not dirty up some of the beauty that I have. And this little tree might save a touch of it as well. Trying to put it down with a little bit of a dry brush uh, application so it's a roughness. So it doesn't look like, oops, sorry, I'm off the camera. I probably apologize. Every now and then I get going, carried on. I'm just putting more white mask over here, white mask on that part, white mask on this section here or there way over here on the left side, add a little white mask so I can paint the ground. So you don't believe it's there, but it is. I did not put it on the very dark. Uh, I don't think I'll put it on that building. So the church, the rooftop, a couple of these trees that pop up above the, uh, now just little dots, so there's little accent spots here and there. I can't even see that well. I'd have to look on an angle with a bright light. And so I'll put the, cover on this so you can see what this is. So that's called uh, white mask. Incredible, ooh, incredible white mask. How about that stuff? Now it has uh, dried. So, someone asked, the, I couldn't find the white mask to order it. Any suggestions? Uh, Art Academy Live has the white mask. Uh, they also have another tool that I use and, and I thought pretty handy as well. Uh, while I'm doing is I'm cleaning out my brush with lighter fluid. So the idea of soaping up the brush means if I'm only gonna put one little spot on the steeple, then I have to soap the brush up, dip it in the mask, do another spot, then soap the brush and then dip it in the mask in a spot. So I just brush away and when I'm all done, because I'm using a natural hair brush, I'm able to dissolve with this lighter fluid uh, any of the uh, mask that has dried in the brush hairs. And so a smaller brush, 
Yeah, good point. Linda mentioned that uh, if you use a synthetic brush to put frisket on, that's okay. But if you use lighter fluid to clean out your synthetic brush, it'll melt the hairs. So don't, another reason not to use synthetic brushes. Once in a while, but not for, for me. I want to have the ability to use the edge, the side, the heel, the belly, and the corner. We had another three-hour class on just all the different brush strokes. There's another pretty handy tool uh, I'll share with you. It's called a mask pen. And so that's the fine line mask pen. And it has uh, a great ability to just do small spots. And so if I wanted to have the cross up there, uh, I wanted to paint just that little steeple that's, uh, or chimney, whatever. It's a design shape to break up the straight of the roof. So it doesn't clog. And then when you're all finished, uh, there is a needle in here that goes inside the straw. And so that keeps it from clogging. So very f small parts. If I just had a rooftop, I would have used the mask pen. It does not dry clear. So when I'm done with this fluid, uh, I put the fluid of, of white mask, which is very transparent so thin that I can actually spray it out with a spray bottle for some special effects, sparkle and water and so forth. So an old brush, natural hair brush, apply the frisket, clean out your brush with lighter fluid, you know, then I'll, I'll rinse out the brush later on. And so I do use masks a lot of times, but not as much as what one normally thinks, and that is to save the white items, but not only to save those white items, but to save a little bit of the color. So we'll let that dry naturally. I could use a hair dryer on it. I want, I have some time to paint some of the uh, shadow uh, on the ground. And what did my plan tell me? The plan tell me to have a little patch of sunlight coming across this painting. And so to have a little patch of light coming across and have some shadows across the bottom. So a larger area of shadow across the bottom. I still have some of my shadow dark of the background that is a variety of color. And so I'll take in, uh, make use of some of it and paint a colorful pattern of middle value across the front. I had enough paint to keep on going, but I just have this little habit of a couple of brush strokes, stop, clean out the brush, dry out the brush. Maybe I'll use the edge of the brush to have a little rougher look. So a good number of times, I make use of the end. So this is where I, I tap the brush in my palette. I'm doing it on the paper for you. But then I raise the brush up. Now my hand's going to be a little bit in the way, but I'm taking making use of this 3 quarter inch flat brush to do some branches and twigs where I might want a little more rough edge. Instead of using a round brush or just doing too perfect you know, of a line. So again, my hand, you can never see it. And so I could get a little more interesting and the paper's floating and bumping. So it's even crazier. Don't do that. But I want you to get a close up of see how I'm using just the edge of this brush to capture a little pattern other than just the side of the brush doing some scraping. A perfect spot for a little spray bottle uh, action as well. And so this is my hooker's green in a spray bottle and let that be a way of showing some bushes or shrubs uh, along the way. Having a little color shift, that's a little, and a different size. I like that little patch of light coming through. It's not in my design. Oh, it is. Oh, how about that? I thought the same thing twice. A little piece of light coming through here. I'm gonna let that take place as well. Uh, that's the way I can show this uh, shadow up and down, in and out, thick and thin. Time for a little of my Burnt Sienna Ultramarine, Alizarin Crimson. Took me a second. I don't think colors as I'm painting, but students like to know, and so I have to change my whole process sometimes of try to name a color. This giant brush can do delicate little marks as well. So I'm just using the corner of the brush. Give you a little close up what's taking place there. So just the corner. So once I shape the brush, Here's where I can now just have delicate little marks such as that for leaves. I can do the side of the brush for scraping, but I still have a ton of paint in this brush, so I don't have to dry out my brush. Here's where the belly part, that's where the belly can do dry brush, raise the brush up, and I can get a nice clean edge that way, or as I'm painting with the edge, or the corner. So I've taught myself to use the edge, the side, the corner of the brush for all of that variety of marks. Visually interesting. 
So planning out the design, looking at my reference, I don't have to guess where I'm about to take and place this. I do have a suggestion of shadow coming large and high, where I came in across here, now I'm gonna go higher and higher and higher. That's a composition change there. Different type marks, I think it's time for even a sponge mark. I did a spray bottle, I did the side of the brush, did a corner of the brush, did the edge of the brush. Now I'm even gonna use a sponge, because just like the variety of color, these little marks, Here's a sponge to make some grasses. Look at how the sponge can do that. My flat brush can do this as well. So I'm giving the viewer visual triggers, a trigger of a color shift, a trigger of a value change, the trigger of a different brush mark. And these little visual triggers are forms of entertainment. That's what I want this painting to be, is entertaining, not a report of how it is in Elburn or up in Lake County. It's a matter of, I'm just making art using those locations, using that variety of good shapes and design. Here I can use this same flat brush to do some of that wispy tall grass pattern look. This is a change of pace, change of variety. Get some good darks coming in here, negative painting, positive. So again, I'm not thinking about items, I'm thinking about positive and negative, lights and darks, variety of color, different marks. Rebecca's loving all the different things you can do with that brush. Yeah, it's a magic brush, and it's like I say, it's the number one tool, you don't need a lot of them. Rebecca, I'm gonna do this you know, whole painting with this three quarter inch. Now and then, if I had some architecture uh, of a larger size, I might use the half-inch size, but the, uh, it holds a lot more paint. It can create a lot more different marks with its edge. And it goes along with the idea of starting loose. So this spray bottle, excuse me, this brush allows me to start loose, and I can always tighten up later. So look for one that has extra length out. Uh, this is called a Renaissance, made by Silver Brush. This one you can find in some stores, the spray bottles you won't find in stores, so. And I'll add my spray bottle to give a little color shift down in here. Break that up and I'll fill in some of that white space later on. A little white space here. I'll block out. So I'm looking at this outer edge, the, uh, the top part of this middle value grouping. I might enhance the contrast just a touch more in a few areas. So between this shadow and this grass, uh, I don't see quite enough of a value shift. So at the top part, every now and then in a few places here, I'm going to add a little extra dark. Mostly this is mid-tone. I've connected it in with the fence. So at this top part, I'm now enhancing the contrast, the secret sauce, so that there's a big notice to, as this being different, change the color, go back to a little of that hooker's green. So I want the viewer to notice how I gave the sense of depth a little stronger here by making this top line uh, a touch darker. And this is the top line of a vertical plane compared to this horizontal pattern of the shadow. So I'll take you back wide a little bit. Could use a hair dryer on this, but I'm going to spend some time on the sky and show you a neat trick for a finishing touch. Let me just take a minute uh, and clean house here. And so I like to have I've got paint on my board underneath. I use a, a, a gator board uh, as a surface that I can prop up. So, um, so a good number of times I probably paint, you know, on about a uh, a two inch uh, or one inch angle, so gravity lets the paint flow downward, and so you can take a bottle like this and take this whole board, not the paper, take the whole board and prop it up on that particular uh, spray bottle. It's about a one inch angle. That'll keep the, f the gravity flow going uh, in one direction. Tell them you sprayed it black. And I did paint it black so it's easier to clean up, yes. All right, so clean up my palette. And usually when I shift from one layer, from the light layer to the dark, or to the mid-tone, when I shift from the 
vertical plane of trees to the horizontal plane of the grass or the ground. Uh, a good number of times I'm doing what I'm doing here, and that is cleaning out the palette, getting a fresh start uh, to painting in it. So I go back to that checklist that we had at the starting point. Uh, I use it as a review uh, along the way. How is the focal point? Boy, it speaks loud. A good number of times you may have to uh, crop off you know, an unfinished section, you know, such as the sky. So do I see this area having more energy? I can quiet down that section. I can quiet down that section later on. But at this point, I feel that that is my focal point is still working. How is there, how's the value changes? Yes, I think there's a good feeling of lights and darks. There's a touch of mid-tone. There's a shape here I might adjust. Looks like kind of a straight line. I have, might have a few more bumps like this along the way. So that's not an ideal shape over on this side. It's a bumpy shape, but this is more definitive. How it comes across then goes up. So I'm going to watch that particular shape over there. Uh, adjust it. There's a variety of color to each and every one of the parts. So is that I have my warm color dominance. I'm going to enhance that warmth uh, in a minute uh, with a, a color going across the bottom of the painting, but I'm not sure what color yet. And I'm going to show you a neat little sunset technique for the sky that starts out with no sunset in the sky. And why do I want a sunset sky? Uh, either a sunset or a sunrise, because what I'm wanting out of this painting is the glow of warmth. I wanted the rich color of the fall and almost a glow of warmth, so I want to have a glow in the sky. So I'll start out with a suggestion of some cumulus clouds, and I've even given thought to that. Should I have cumulus or stratus? I've given thought, do I want to have more clouds and less sky or more sky and less clouds? And so I have decided more clouds, and I feel the uh, there's more of a rounded flow than there is the architectural look of stratus clouds. So this rounded flow is telling me to deal with a rounded shape to the, and by having cleaned out my brush only at the top one inch, I still have water, even though it looks a little crusty, it still is clean enough. I'll change it in a minute when I do something else. Most important element for the sky is going to be a value change. I'm going to go from light to dark. I'm going to reduce the elevation to kind of a one inch. There's already a slight slant on my artboard to begin with. Uh, I'll warm up some of the sky with a little bit of uh, uh, magenta that was alizarin. So I'll sweep it out of there. So I have a little bit of, uh, even though they look very much similar. So that's where you want to check out all the colors that I use, if you want to, on my website, what colors I have in my palette. So it's cobalt and magenta. I'm going to have a touch of an ochre as I come down to the bottom. There's going to be a value change in the sky. For the moment, I'm going to have it be dark at the top. I'm going to use the side of the brush to go around some of the rough edges for that cloud. Go even darker. Here's a touch of magenta. I want to warm this sky up. Even though I'm going to have a sunset effect in the sky soon. And I'm going to just a hint of ultramarine to go a touch darker. I don't wet this first. I want a hard edge. Why do I want a hard edge? Because there is a majority of hard edges downstairs. I'll use my dot spray bottle, or this is an old Windex spray bottle. Nita Engel got me started on spray bottles. And then I have added you know, a bunch of colors. So these are all, I've got all my, all these spray bottles. Um, in a workshop, my students only have seven colors in a spray bottle. Uh, I have every color in a spray bottle and sometimes even two. So a little bit of a ochre, as I said, just to have a little soften and a couple of edges this way. Continue that mixture, adding a fresh mixture. Not too cool of a blue. I'm going to keep it warm color dominant. I'll have almost a gray coming up soon. I'll go to a lighter value momentarily at the bottom. A little color shift along the way like I did here. A little sharper edge in a few spots. A little puff of a cloud pattern here. It's all about shapes. Up and down, in and out, thick and thin. 
Here's where, again, that paper that if the color sets too fast, then you're going to have a hard edge. So uh, I liked uh, what the Fabriano, whatever type of sizing that they put on it so that the color won't set quite so quickly. Soften a few edges. I'm going to do it with a touch of a, uh, a little rose color, kind of a... So with, with my brush, I'm going to soften an edge. On occasion, I'll use a tissue to soften an edge. On occasion, I'll use a tissue to create a cloud. Or I can just roll the tissue across this white area and create a little cloud pattern, a little different looking than what I'm doing with the brush. Again, just like I used a sponge or a spray bottle or the side of a brush for a touch of the tree, I'm using different tools, different marks, different techniques, different ways to paint the cloud so that I leave different marks, different visuals, change into a little more of the cerulean, coming in with a little, uh, that Sennelier red, kind of creating a rose color that way. I'll have some darker clouds at the same time in a moment. So um, kind of setting the stage for what I'm about to do is the sunset. I could have gone right to sunset colors, but I wanted to have there be a, I'm going to do a little bit of a gray. This is a burnt sienna and ultramarine. I wanted to have an edge in the sky is the reason I started doing the clouds first. Now I want to have some edges to the clouds here. So I'm having there be a, there's ultramarine. Burnt sienna kind of creates a gray. I want to warm it up with a little bit of uh, magenta. Got that mixture of variety. And here's where having the liquid frisket, there's no way I could have painted this cloud-like pattern going across a tree. And so that is protecting that tree. And here's where I do want this sky color to go onto the distant hill so as to merge the two together. So that's another reason I'm doing my sky last. I can pick a color such as this dark that will enhance the white. I can pick a pattern without having to interrupt some of those vertical trees. I can have this sky color go over the most distant. So I have frisket on here. So I'll give you a close up there. I have frisket on there saving so you can see how it saved this tree, saved that treetop. But I do want the sky color to go across the most distant item. That's the reason I'm painting it last, to merge, to soften, to mute that edge, to make that distant item do just that. Go further back. Go right across here. The paint peeled off. Take you back just a touch. The paint peeled off the top of the steeple, and the paint peeled off. So a good quality paper, and you can come back. So as I'm going to dry this, I'm going to take my liner brush and do, well, I'm going to soften an edge here a touch with the tissue. Could have used this damp brush. I'm going to soften an edge here with just the moisture on a brush. And I'm going to start drying, but we're not finished. I've got a big finish for you here. So soften a few edges. And so as this dries, let me just soften another edge. If a watermark happens, I'm not too worried about it in the clouds. It's kind of a pattern, an edge that's so I'm not hiding the fact that I paint in watercolor. And sometimes a, water, a watermark showcases that particular item. So while I'm painting, I'm going to be taking a little darker value in my brush and go left and right and across just to give a little design change. So here, this natural hair and long hair. So a round brush would just be a little too more pointed, a little too perfect, a little too precise. And this is kind of an out of control brush. And I can create little wispy shadow bottom parts to the, to the cloud, such as in here. So it holds a lot of paint. And so I'm modifying that cloud-like. And a good amount of this is going to disappear soon, so don't, don't quit. Don't stop. It's too much white for this painting to be finished. 
still doesn't help my focal point. All those beautiful clouds, I think, are just too much white, and the white that's wanting to glow in my focal point area has competition. And so that's the reason I'm not gonna leave this as it is, even though the sky is good looking by itself. Save that sky for another painting. Here's something in a moment extra that you can do to the sky. And I'm putting extra darks in that cloud where near the focal point zone. This may not even show up later, but I'm doing it anyway. Now I'm gonna soften a few of the edges. So this is just a damp brush, not wet, dried it out on my sponge. Blending it upstairs slowly. Don't want any straight lines. We talked about that in the beginning, your composition. A little heavy blue spot there. I'll take and blend it out. See how the paint is rolled right off the top of the tree? And see the fact that it dried clear. I can see that the sky behind is dark enough. So if I had a frisket that dried opaque, you wouldn't be able to see that little light spot up against the sky. So I really like the fact that that white mask dries transparent so I can see that particular blending and value change as it should be. All right, I'm about to do something fun. I learned this from Nita Angle. Great little sunset technique. I'm gonna take three brushes while I clean all this out and while I continue drying. Oops, got a little spot of paint there. Just splashed out of my palette. I generally don't have my palette that close to my painting, but I'm doing it for you. So we're gonna clear this out and I'm gonna have three brushes and three different colors. The colors are going to be my bright, clean, lemon yellow. My bright, and you need a perfect red. A cad red is not gonna do this. If you have cad red as your basic red, you don't have a pure red in your palette. And cobalt blue, most of us have that particular color. And so a separate brush for each of these. I think for the first time, I'll probably set that aside and go for a clean bucket of water. So we'll run a few minutes over an hour and a half, but you're having fun. And I got something you've got to see. All right, so a clean bucket of water. Let's have three different sections in the palette and have these three different colors. Might even put a fresh sponge up there in case I get color coming off of the off of the sponge. All right, this is a there's my lemon yellow. You can see the old bit of Holbein's yellow, which was permanent yellow lemon. It's still thick. I'm gonna avoid it because it's harder to dissolve. So a nice clean yellow, even though down in that corner I have a, a dollop of. All right, set that aside. I'm gonna grab a fresh box of, of uh, tissue. And oh, there you go. I don't want to run out of tissue at this moment, so I'm going to open up a fresh box of tissues. And I want to buy, make sure you use uh, inexpensive uh, or cheap tissues, reason being they absorb more. If your tissues um, have any cologne, lotion, antiseptic in them, they're not quicker picker-uppers. So, all right, back to, I wanted to have a little piece of tissue because I felt this was green down in that corner. All right, so a separate brush for each of these. There's a separate brush for the uh, yellow. Here's a separate brush for the red. And you want to mix a nice sizable puddle. You don't want to have to come back and remix because you want these mixtures to be consistent uh, with one another. And see if I can squeeze this color over here, cobalt blue, and not let it run too much into my red. All right, so I have three different colors, three different mixtures. Painting is dry. Frisket is still in place. I'm going to put a light spray of water across the painting and apply these colors. I'll do the sky first. I'll do the rest of the painting later on. So 
So I'm squeezing hard, getting a light spray of water going across. And I like this glow of light to be at the top. Now, even though you're going to see green, don't panic just yet. That green will disappear. Here's where the type of paper, the paint's not soaking in fast. Another factor. Otherwise, you've got to do it super fast and blot that yellow off of the, of the green. Notice I didn't put it down very evenly. Ah, that's the blue and the red. Don't do that. Wrong brush. Go the red next. Put it down below that yellow and then overlap, then bring it upstairs. And notice I'm not doing straight lines. Zigzag back and forth, up and down. And now I'll see that was the red. Put it back in the red. Let's go clean out this blue and start back with this blue and put blue across the bottom. Refresh the mixture so you don't run out of paint. And as you go darker, you could also go with a little ultramarine and or a touch of my blue and danthrene. It's a super dark, but it's a blue base. Might want to have a little touch of alizarin in there. So as I go darker, I now want to take a go. As I said, you may not see some of those. So I'm just changing up the blue a little bit. Going all the way across. The Frisca is going to protect those white spots. I do not have, oh, I did have Frisca down the roof line. Forgot about that. Let's see a dollop of water there, right across the hill. And that emerged those edges. Then there's another spray of water coming on top of this to help me do my blending. And before I do some of that blending, I'm going to take a tissue uh, and roll it to eliminate the green. So there is a green because I have blue on top of Excuse me, I have yellow on top of my blue sky. And so that's picking up the extra yellow. And now my sky is a clean color from where I started, but it's dry. And so now I'm going to raise this up. So I'm going to have you uh, see it from this particular uh, angle so that you can realize that I'm really raising this up quite a bit. Uh, it's not like a little angle or shaking. Uh, and if it doesn't start running real quick, then add even more spray of water. And so that's going to encourage the running. Then slowly, slowly, slowly do I rotate this, and that'll cause those colors to blend in. So good amount of running. If I want more uh, orange to, or red to come into the yellow to create the orange, last it that way a little bit longer, then lay it flat and then go around the outside and pick up the excess. That's eliminating what might be a touch of the green. And then while it's drying, I'm also going to pick up a touch. So a little, a little streak of water here must have run down quicker. So I'm going to blend that blue just a little bit left and right. Tom, lift it up just a little bit because there's a glare in yeah. that section. Yeah. I've got to gotta smooth this out here first. There we go. So I can add just a touch of more blue. Uh, into the bottom of that cloud. That's the cobalt blue. So just kind of lacing it in there, but not a perfect boring brush stroke. So I wanted to have a little more color shift, not to have the red be that large. You could also make those little color changes or adjustments uh, with a, a toothbrush. Not too much with the spray bottle. So I know there's a lot of shine, but I'm going to smooth that part out. So while it's drying, I'm going to do something extra. And I'm going to pick up a little extra uh, white off of the cloud so that it has a touch of a white accent. So first get rid of some of the green that might appear from the yellow laying on the blue. Don't see I have a problem with that too much anymore. I can come back in and do some accent shading in the clouds as well. But here's where I want to take and dry a little bit of this and have a little white highlight accent to a touch of the top of the cloud. And I keep grabbing a fresh tissue and crunch it. So I want to just pull off a little extra light value, even across. So I'm picking up some extra light value, even inside the cloud. So that way the cloud isn't perfectly flat. There's little shading changes taking place. Let's see if you can see those up close. So those little light accents there, that's the tissue rolling. I like that color. I'm going to leave that one. I'll lift off here a little bit, or maybe below, so I can lift off little accents. 
And so a couple of those just adds a little thickness or dimension to the cloud. You could also take uh, that liner brush and do some shading on that particular part of the cloud as well. So while it's drying, I want to just add a little bit of depth variation. Depends upon how refined the bottom of the painting is as to how much of this extra shading. And so there's a very little, let you see that up close. I'm coming back with just a little bit of a, of a value shift in that cloud. You may not see it that much. Pencil lines I can erase later. That's got to be the quality of the pigment. So just a subtle little slightly darker value shading taking place. And here's where this scratchy little brush, some of those left and right horizontal, you know, shading marks like we did earlier. So it's change some of those edges. So I'm going to soften an edge with this brush as well. So. But I want to dry it completely before I do too much more in the sky. I want to dry it completely. I want to darken just a hair, that section right here. So that's a, I'm mixing up a cobalt and a magenta. I like this to be just a little bit darker on that side. This is dark enough. I'm going to just, not as a cloud like over here, but just a little shading. That's why the sky was dark at the top, so I had a nice light value against the top of the cloud. Here's what I want to make sure is I'm adding a wash across here that I have this dry. So I want to just blend this in. Generally dangerous to have it be that hot from a hair dryer and then coming back and doing a, because it will dry irregularly. But I'm living on the edge. So slightly darker there. Why I wanted to pop out that uh, feeling of the white of the roof of my focal point area. So I just want a general darker shading on this left side. I have a specific darker shading of a cloud-like pattern. Let me just dry that side over here. So just a slightly darker, makes the white of the roof just pop out. And so now I can have a chance to take that frisket off and then come back and bring some of that warm glow of my sky onto the landscape. Right now there's like two different stories going on here. The sky story, the sunset glow, and then just this light and dark pattern uh, at the bottom of the painting. And I want to bring this warm glow into the bottom or unify these two parts. Need to have this dry because when you peel off this rubber cement pickup, I don't want to tear up any paper. I don't have as much a problem with that straight line because remember I said before the design, I hardly see it, the transition between the sky and the, that distant hill. And so here's where just a rubber cement pickup picks up the color. I'm using the, my hand to feel if it feels bumpy. As you can see, it hasn't taken off any paint. Same thing here. Now we have that little white accents of the church in the distance. Still a little frisket over here. So I'm going to reserve the freshness of the white paper in and around my focal point area and come back with some of the same color glazes that I used for the sky, even though I'm going to mix a fresh version of them. I see there's more pink, sometimes there's more of a um, orange color, you know, in this sky. If I, whatever color is more dominant, I'm going to bring downstairs. So I'm going to bring some of this pink color to the lower part of the painting. And that was made with my Sennelier red, a cobalt blue, or the cerulean blue, and that Sennelier red. Even this, the clean quality of the red. One or two spots are going to get a touch of an orange. Just a hint of an orange in a few spots here. Or even a touch of a yellow, we'll decide that later on. So doing this now to bring and harmonize that warm glow from the upstairs to the downstairs part of the painting. Unity is an important part. And so I'm having a nice, here's where a soft hair, a natural hairbrush, bringing in this uh, warmth 
you can see where those tints of those rose color that I'm applying, which is the rose color just like what's over in the, in the clouds, bringing that downstairs. And I'll save a little bit of white. I'm gonna save a lot of white for this section of the painting, but we'll start hinting. Maybe here's where I'll use a touch of the orange going across. So nice and transparent. Softness of a natural hair brush, even onto the ground. So there is this warm glow. That's the reason I wanted this painting. No, I didn't want to paint six buildings, a farmer's field, a fence. I didn't want to paint objects. I wanted to make a piece of art that was more than objects. It had a little feeling of glow to it. So I'll take some of that rose color. I'll leave a little bit lower. I'll use it and a touch of the blue to make up a violet down in this area where I left some of the white. So now some of these blue colors are harmonized in with this shadow forward area of the painting. Someone wants to know how to spell Sennelier red. S-E-N-N-E-L-I-E-R. -E you got it, thank you, Linda. I don't know if they heard me. French that. brand's been out for 300 years, so they know what they're doing. S-E-N-N-E-L. L-I-E-R. You got it. I had to think there for a minute, right? Yeah, it's French. Took a look at it. We're good. Taking some of those uh, rose colors, taking some of these violet purple colors, accenting it to the bottom of the painting. Very few, but a here and there accent of the clean light orange, maybe the top of the tree. Now then a rose color over to the side. Here's where that white space, if I didn't leave that white space, this wouldn't have worked out half as well because you'd be putting just a, uh, this light color on top of mid-tone or dark and it's not gonna show up. Here's where a nice little glow of orange across the ground. But what's different for the focal point is gonna be the white quality. So feeling how I've given this glow, taking the sky glow and bringing it into the downstairs, and by being a natural hair brush, I'm not gonna muck up, this is all dry here, but I'm not gonna disturb an edge, I'm not gonna, a little purple on this side as well, purple over there, might be a little too much light over here, so we'll take a touch of that uh, rose color, leave just a little piece of white, take a little bit of the blue, so I keep looking, I make a mark, I make a brush stroke, and I look back at the focal point, see if it helps enhance it. I make a mark and look at, see if it brings color down from the uh, sky of the painting and helps enhance what's going on. So I'm all about adding an enhancement. And then later we can come back and so you have this big dark area. And so here's an example. Remember I showed you the chart where I took that tree that was dry, this forest that was dry. I did some dot spray bottle prime the pump, you know, put a few of those dots there just as a little color shift in the heavy dark area. So you can add accents like that uh, later on. And were I to do more, you could if you want to, it's not gonna become a better painting, but you could go back and do more and the thing to do is start at the focal point, develop a little more edge, a little more contrast, and keep looking at what you have behind a mat because my focal point doesn't need more. This painting doesn't need any more. Uh, if I add too many more refinements, I'm quieting down this back, back church area, just a touch more, a little more in shadow, just the top. So I'm just watching it, shading a little bit of this part of the roof. So I'm helping enhance this focal point by quieting down. I can come back and take my finger and soften a few edges to the shadow sides of different parts. And so any refinements that you're now gonna start doing, my suggestion, they should be done only with a mat on the painting. Be sure to have a mat because a mat gives you that sense of refinement. You're seeing it from a distance. You're getting an overall feel for the painting. There's a smaller size. So I keep a, you know, a handy mat available to me uh, so I can quickly look at it. And actually I would paint further if I was to do anything more with a mat on the painting. Now, the light mat is gonna help me see the dark areas. And a dark mat, I know that goes against a lot of art club rules, so change the rule. 
because look and see what this dark mat is going to do. It's going to take and make this focal point just pop out. Look at how the glow of the light, look at the glow of the light is just exaggerated by not seeing more white in and around the painting. So that's the, to me, the importance of, slide this over so you can see it full frame. So the importance of, so once again, not every watercolor, just because you're painting in watercolor, don't like that size of that one. These all I like, little accents of yellow, so I'm gonna leave them. Just because you're painting in watercolor doesn't mean we have to always have a light mat or a white mat. This dark, because this dark is kind of jumping out with this light mat as well. This dark over here jumps out. I don't want you seeing that particular darks. The whole idea was to have this little path of light in a, in a sense of a warm glow. So let me take you on a close-up tour of the finish of this painting. It starts with that focal point where we have saved more of the white space. Now the rest of the painting, there's a suggestion of shapes and values, but not the amount of refinement that is happening at the focal point area. Your church is still there, but it's an accent that you find later on. Notice how the shading of those oranges and reds that I have gone across the painting and smudging and softening some edges with my finger. That's easy to do. Yes, I'm gonna leave some of these yellows. They won't dry that particular uh, dark because it's a uh, light color on top of dark and that will not be that light. So I'm gonna leave it that way. Just trust me, that'll work. Now, if you felt the need to do more detail, you would start in this area, add a little bit more, then around it a little less, then around it a little less. And as you went further and further, less and less. And so there's, you know, if anything, I see this could have a touch of a value change, the brightness of that particular tree over here. And so I'll even I'll soften an edge, smudge a little more, not have that light of a value, not as bright over this area, not as, as light a value. So I'm gonna increase the shadow side. And so the eye will then go to, won't spend a lot of time there. So I, I observe how and where the eye is gonna go and how much time is it gonna spend. And so if I don't want it to spend a lot of time there, then I can put a little bit of shading across some of that roof, make that roof disappear even more. I'll take the back side of this one. I'm gonna sneak underneath here, and this is covering my palette, so I'm gonna have a little cobalt blue and a little bit of that magenta. So I see this building in the background just jump out at you just a little more. So I'll do it little by little. So I'll go across you know, a third of it, and then I'll go across more than half of it, and then I'll make a decision to stop before I go across all of it. So just toning down just that building a little bit more, and it's an inch, so now it's two thirds in shadow and one third in sunlight is a little more interesting pattern and doesn't jump out. Or I could come back with my hand and soften the edge. That's where the paper doesn't let the, doesn't soak in so far that it becomes hard to soften some of those edges. So the message was to have a plan you know, before you start. And I don't want to take and lose the message because of the romance and excitement of the finished painting, but the success of it is having a little bit of a plan. I had a good design. I decided to go with two thirds dominant sky. And in that proportion of the land parts, they were three different proportions. I chose three different value shifts so I could exaggerate the depth instead of having to do detail. I explored what colors I was gonna use for the light areas, what colors I was gonna use for the dark areas, and in the focal point area, I had some extra color enhancement with that bright yellow, the white space, and that phthalo blue. Starting loose, you can always tighten up a loose painting, and so that's my message for you is to, let me back up just a touch, that was my message for you in a short amount of time, but I wanted to share with you something to make you a better painter, and that planning stage was what I thought was important. You're gonna see at the end uh, a series of paintings that I created up in Dillman's, and each is a different look, only because of the plan, only because of I experimented in color with a preliminary before I jumped into the painting. So that was my message, was to plan for success as opposed to finding a good picture and jumping right in. So, Lake Region, I appreciate you. David, thanks for getting uh, all of your uh, friends aware of me and sharing with what I do. Uh, we can't come over and invite you to my uh, barn that I've converted into a classroom, but I'm doing monthly online classes, and for now, 
Uh, they're not the uh, Zoom class where uh, you're painting, but I'm doing three hours of concentrated explanation of different items. We're gonna have, uh, oh, and Judy, I uh, would like for you to pick a number between one and 16, because we have a, a winner. So uh, Linda, let me know when Judy has picked a number between one and 16, and I'll share with you someone's gonna win a spot. So I'm doing a class uh, later this month on just doing rays of sunlight and shadow. So we've got a comprehensive class. You can see it uh, again a couple of times and watching me for three hours sharing with you a lot more information. I kind of, you know, jumped over a few things. You know, we spent three hours on skies, clouds, and sunsets, and you got, you know, you got 10 minutes of it, which was helpful. But I want to take a, and do some classes that I've felt are really important where it's a concentrated amount of information. So we're going to do that one. We're going to do another one on forests. Got it? Number seven. Uh, forests, rivers, lakes, and reflections. So we're gonna spend three hours. And then later you can watch that again, practice the next day, practice the next day, each of those little parts. So the beauty of this demo, you now get to watch it again and you can put stop. Take a look at that sketch that I had. Take a look at the value change that I have. Another one on how to plan for success, all those little preliminaries that make for an important little uh, stage along the way. So Linda, did you say number, um, seven, number seven? So we are going to zoom in and find out who is number seven, Judy, Judy Hollister. Hollister. Oh, sorry about that, Judy. You picked one away from you. So what I did, I put all the names that have come in. I, I randomly uh, put up a, a bunch of different numbers across. And so, uh, Judy Hollister, you have gotten a chance to attend one of those uh, uh, online classes that I'm going to have later this month Tell on September them. 21st, September 24th, or the 28th. Go to my website, TomLynch.com. Go to the uh, workshops, go to the online, see which one of those classes that you'd like to attend. Uh, you can go to next month in November. You can see what I'm teaching in November. So pick a favorite class, my gift to you. Uh, for anyone else, I hope you join me in more demos. Hope you enjoy me, which I have a few of them on Art Academy Live. That's where you can get a lot of uh, art lessons there. And um, uh, a few YouTube videos at the same time. So that is, my hope that you had some fun, you learned a few things, someone won a spot, and um, you saw a painting be created, a blank sheet of paper turning into this. It sure is fun. We'll share with you different ways, different examples, capturing super, super moods. I want to have you see a demo called the wow factor someday. So there is uh, uh, something for you to look forward to. And once again, Miss Judy Arvidson. You're going to get to be in one of those classes for free. So all it is a matter of clicking on the same link like you clicked here. You just click on a link. I'll send it to you. So email me uh, or I'll email you uh, once you decide which class you'd like. So any last questions, uh, Linda? You got it. You had fun. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Stay safe. Keep your mask on. Stay home. And take advantage of some of these online classes. How about the super close-up? And there's been times I brought out a half a dozen paintings to show a particular lesson. So we can make the best out of this. You can get to be a better painter. Do like I've done. Don't get in your comfort zone. I changed paints and I tried different papers and I'm trying to get better at the same time. So I'll share with you all I know in our next class. I thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.